Brad Lubbin is an Extension Associate Professor, Policy Specialist, and Director of the North Central Extension Risk Management Education Center and the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He has more than 25 years experience in teaching, research, and extension, focusing on agricultural policy and agricultural economics and working in Illinois, Kansas, and Nebraska. His expertise includes federal farm policy, agricultural policy development and education, and agricultural risk management education. He grew up on a grain and livestock farm near Burr, southeast of Lincoln, and holds degrees from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and Kansas State University. Kayla Bergman grew up on a row crop and a cow-calf farm in the southeast corner of Iowa. She has a background of conservation and watershed management and currently manages the agricultural policy portfolio at the Center for Rural Affairs. Kayla is located in central Iowa in a town called Nevada, where she and her husband, Ryan, own a small farm they just seeded in the Conservation Reserve Program. Graham P. Christensen is the founder and president of the GC Resolve, a communications and consulting company who focuses on grassroots community development, mobilization, and education with an emphasis on environment and equality, and the creation of more resilient communities. Graham owns and operates a second business, uh, GC Revolt, a solar and alternative energy development company, and is the state secretary and a director for the Nebraska Farmers Union. Graham is still actively involved in operating Christensen Farms Incorporated with his family, where the Christensen's are adopting regenerative principles on their farm. Eric Saviano is the program manager for Nebraska Appleseed's Economic Justice Food and Nutrition Access Program. In this role, he works to help individuals and families across the state get the food and nutrition they need to thrive. His work specifically focuses on the advocacy for SNAP and child nutrition programs in schools. Welcome to a discussion on the Farm Bill and the Outlook for Farm and Food Policy Issues. I'm Brad Lubin. I'm an Extension Associate Professor in Agricultural Economics at UNL, and much of my time is focused on agricultural policy issues. That generally leads to a focus on federal farm legislation and the Farm Bill. But when I talk the Farm Bill, I often remind audiences that it's a whole lot more than just the farm. We can see components of the Farm Bill that date to the earliest days of, of uh, federal farm legislation with commodity support programs, conservation programs, and crop insurance programs that compromise really a farm portfolio. But there is so much more in the Farm Bill. And in particular, think of the nutrition title, which if you know your statistics, is somewhere between two, uh, three fourths and 80% of total spending in a typical Farm Bill. These are projected outlays for the 2018 Farm Bill as it passed outlays for the next 10 budget years. Nutrition was, was pegged at 77% of the total. That farm portion of the farm bill, crop insurance, commodities, conservation, was just a little over 20%. And that meant that everything else, as vital and critical as it may be, everything else actually fit into less than 1% of the total. Nutrition really does carry the weight when we talk about investments in the farm bill. Maybe that's why it is often thought of as not just the farm bill, but the farm and food bill. Well, that farm and food bill is a historic coalition. It's the 1973 farm bill that was the first one where the food title or the food assistance programs were really formally included as part of the broader bill and part of the broader coalition that helped a farm bill across the finish line. Every farm bill since, and we regularly do this every three, four, five, six years, Every farm bill since has included that farm and food coalition to help push a farm bill to the finish line. 2008 represented maybe a new chapter in that, in that it was the last farm bill where we had new money. That is, we typically debate farm bills according to the baseline projection as of what it would take, to what it would cost to simply extend existing programs for 10 more years. 2008 was the first farm bill, the last farm bill, I should say, where we had new money to spend above that baseline, but all of that new money was committed to nutrition assistance. It's a, it's a representation of the change in dynamics where food really does dominate the agenda, at least in terms of support. The 2014 Farm Bill and the 2018 Farm Bill were both substantial fights over spending, 
uh, ultimately the 14 farm bill demanded cuts in spending and every title shared in some of that budget pain uh, every title including nutrition but nutrition had a relatively modest cut in 2018 we battled over over funding ultimately came up with a flat farm bill that spent exactly baseline projections going forward we're preparing to debate the next farm bill which is due in 2023 We'll see how this farm and food policy discussion continues into that farm bill. Now, when I talk about how that policy discussion goes, I want to talk about just a bit of history and a recognition that, uh, as documented in, in some uh, publications, uh, a in the literature, a recommendation or a realization that the policy process is really frustrating and it's fragmented. And there are so many groups involved that it's really difficult to keep track of all of them. Uh, let alone keep track of the coalitions that are forming to work on this issue versus that issue versus breaking apart to focus on something new. None of those groups typically have the power to really achieve their objectives. We only need watch Congress today to realize how difficult it is to actually positively push something across the finish line. But all of those groups typically have some power to really block things from happening. And again, just look at Congress today and recognize uh, the challenges of trying to move something forward. No groups really have the power to do something. All groups have the power to block something. That really means that nothing happens until you build a coalition. Another lesson on what we are or aren't effectively accomplishing today may be in the policy process. But farm bills traditionally have been about coalition building. Now, historically, the coalition was fairly simple because the farm bill process was fairly isolated. We call it the Iron Triangle of Agricultural Policy because there are really only three major interests represented in the Farm Bill or the Farm Policy Debate. There was the Farm Block that represented general farm organizations and commodities. There was the Agricultural Committees in Congress. And there was the Administration, generally represented by the Secretary of Agriculture. If it happened in Farm Policy and to a Farm Bill, it typically happened between those three components of the Iron Triangle. But there have been so many additions and so much growth in the process. It is more open than it's ever been. It's more complicated than it's ever been. If you tried to diagram it today, <laughs> uh, it's hard to even tell where to begin. It's certainly not an Iron Triangle. At best, it looks like a bowl of spaghetti. You really can't tell who's connected to who, except to assume that everything is connected to everything else. There are so many interest groups out there even Congress at the top is much more fractured because there are multiple committees and multiple jurisdictions at, at debate here. The administration is fractured. It's not just the Secretary of Agriculture that really oversees these programs. It's multiple agencies or even sometimes uh, multiple uh, sectors or of, of the same department, of the same organization uh, that are battling over, uh, over issues and over space. But on that interest group side, where there are so many interest groups, it's not just ag. It's ag and agribusiness and trade and international development and environment and consumers and uh, labor and all of those different interests involved, including food policy. But on the food policy side, it's even a little more fractured or at least a little more diverse uh, than it used to be in terms of who is represented and what they are for. Historically, in a farm bill debate, we'd talk about foodies and foodies meant those food interest groups that were fundamentally there to champion the food assistance programs. With credit for this analysis and, and description to Dr. Keith Colbull at Mississippi State University, Keith observed the 2014 Farm Bill process, uh, up development process up close while serving on committee in Washington, D.C. Uh, before returning to Mississippi State. <clears throat> but in that time, Keith was observing all of the different interest groups at play and the political strategies and, and developments that he saw. The traditional foodies fundamentally were there to build coalitions, but to support traditional food assistance programs like SNAP. They are also fundamental proponents of the additional food assistance programs like WIC or the school breakfast, the school lunch, the school breakfast program, etc. Those are incorporated in the Child Nutrition Act, so separate legislation. SNAP is the primary assistance program that shows up in the Farm Bill in the nutrition title. But the traditional foodies have been around for decades uh, supporting that war effort. The neo-foodies or new foodies really have come much more lately to the scene and represent not the interest of food security 
and food assistance, but the interest that food systems aren't responding to consumers or they're not reflecting the values and, and demands of consumers today. Foodies or, or neo-foodies, this, this new foodie in the, in the system, is much more a champion of the new local food systems and the role of local foods in the broader diet or the, the broader uh, uh, ag sector, uh, special traits or unique traits like non-GMOs and specialty crops and animal welfare traits and so forth. All of these additional attributes that consumers might be very interested in, not part of the traditional debate over a safe, secure, abundant, affordable food supply. Okay, Traditional foodies, neo-foodies. When we talk about traditional foodies focus on food assistance, they're fundamentally looking at that federal portfolio of food assistance programs. SNAP is the overwhelming part of that. Just like SNAP is somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of total farm bill spending, SNAP is also actually somewhere between two-thirds and three-fourths of total nutrition assistance. Uh, the, uh, the child nutrition programs, school lunch, school breakfast programs, etc., the WIC program, those things add to the total portfolio and SNAP represents somewhat a similar share of the total food assistance portfolio as it does separately of the total farm bill spending. But the foodies have historically represented those groups and the biggest uh, component there is certainly SNAP. But the discussion and the evolution of the SNAP program from its initial introductions as a food stamp pilot program and through data here through 2016 that would have been post Great Recession, pre pandemic. What we see in the blue line is enrollment and what you see is gradual growth in participation of the, of the program over time as compared to economic uh, activity or economic uh, well-being as best represented by the gray bars which represent economic recessions and the red line which represents the unemployment rate. To the extent that SNAP and other food assistance programs are responsive, that is they provide more assistance when economic conditions have turned down and when the need is greater, SNAP enrollment or SNAP benefits are greater during those periods of weaker economic activity. So if you see the recessions, which match the spikes in, un in unemployment rather dramatically, those are also periods when we substantially increased SNAP participation and general food assistance participation. But you also see over time, including the Great Recession of 08-09, dramatic increases in unemployment, dramatic increases in SNAP. Some of that is the pure economic calculation of need and, and eligibility. Some of that was also expanded benefits and expanded eligibility during the Great Recession. But enrollment rises dramatically. As economic conditions improve, maybe even dramatically, enrollment really only begins to wane over a much more gradual uh, uh, period, which is to say that SNAP has grown over time. It tends to shrink at a much slower rate. It was shrinking pre-pandemic. Now, in the midst of the pandemic, the data would actually show that enrollment in SNAP reached its uh, 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 previous uh, record levels, and so we're talking about uh, substantial enrollment and participation in SNAP in spite of an economy that has actually recovered and continued to steam ahead uh, rather, uh, rather dramatically. That's the kind of debate about SNAP participation, whether it still matches the economic need, at least as calculated in aggregate statistics. Maybe a second set of uh, data suggests that SNAP is less perfectly correlated with economic activity, at least as it is represented by unemployment, and maybe more closely correlated with definitions of poverty. Uh, and if poverty demonstrates not immediate need, but more longer term need, then SNAP may be becoming more of a longer term assistance safety net as opposed to a short run response. That's a fundamental debate for SNAP going forward. Those are some of the issues that got debated during the 2018 Farm Bill when we saw issues like categorical eligibility and standard utility deductions debated. Those are down in the weeds of what SNAP legislation is about, but fundamentally they affect how many people are eligible for the program or what the calculation of benefits in the program is about. And there were fights over and battles over those, largely partisan battles, uh, even amongst what is traditionally a much more nonpartisan bill. Food assistance has become much more of a partisan fight in recent farm bill debates. The last one on the list there, work requirements and education or, or job training requirements, those are clearly the big picture or the big issue in the room. 
relating to SNAP and, and future uh, directions. There are work requirements in the SNAP program as they exist. There are also were waivers of those requirements during uh, the Great Recession and, and since that have left some wondering whether SNAP is really temporary help uh, to help persons get back on track or whether SNAP has become more of a dependency program and a long-term uh, benefit program. That's the kind of debate that we're going to see going forward. For those interested in food assistance and the broader direction of food assistance programs, that's the kind of policy debate that's ongoing. The other side of the spectrum is this food systems question and the increasing demands we have on the food system for particular attributes or characteristics. Food security matters, nutrition matters, but all of these traits like biotech and antibiotic usage and animal welfare and environmental stewardship and other things are attributes that we are demanding more and more of in the food system. How and why? Well, look at the chart on the right. We have taken, this is USDA data, on U.S. households by income. Quintiles of U.S. households by income. The lowest quintile, the lowest 20%, from USD data by household suggests that they're spending around $4,000 per household on food. That $4,000 per household, I don't know if that includes some monetary value of all of the assistance or donations and so forth, but the statistic is $4,000 on food. That is more than one third of their total income. To put that in perspective, to spend more than a third of your total income on food is a statistic that ranks with developing countries. So the lowest quintile in the United States is substantially um, challenged with food availability and food affordability. The highest quintile, the highest 20%, the elite consumer, if you will, they're spending in excess of $14,000 per year on food. They're spending more on food than the lowest quintile makes in income. But to the highest, 20%, that's still only 7-8% of their total, uh, total income. The highest end consumers have the luxury of spending whatever they want on food without much concern about price and affordability, increasingly giving them the luxury of demanding whatever attributes uh, they believe the food system can deliver them, as well as the policy agendas or the policy preferences about what the food system should look like. It's not perfectly a debate between the haves and the have-nots, but there are clearly repercussions of what uh, those that have more income can demand of the food system and what that may or may not mean for uh, the lower income uh, households in the, same, uh, in the same distribution. Now, that's not to say that this is only some elite consumer and these are not values that are represented or, or uh, respected across society. We ask rural Nebraskans, one would think that rural Nebraskans, this is outside of the Omaha and Lincoln metropolitan areas, one would expect rural Nebraskans to really understand agriculture and thus maybe to put less value on these same sorts of demands and attributes that the high-end consumer is demanding. But even in rural Nebraska, this is survey data we asked them more than a decade ago, rural Nebraskans said that it was very important or important to them that a product is made by a small company or a small family farm. Who raised the product still matters. Even when they grow up next to it or when they live next to it, who raises it still matters. That it was humanely raised or environmentally friendly or organic or natural. How it was raised matters. That it was grown in the U.S. or grown in Nebraska or grown locally. Where it was raised matters. That is, consumers, even rural Nebraska consumers, still care about all these attributes that we might call amenities or luxury goods they still care about those attributes as well. The last four, they do care about convenience and nutrition and quality and price. So they do make economic decisions. They do face budget constraints. Uh, they do worry about uh, those economic factors. But to the extent that, that they can, they certainly express interest in and care about all of these various attributes that we might sort of characterize as e elite demands on a, on a food system. Well, <clears throat> Just in the same way that federal legislation and policy do respond to food assistance needs, federal legislation definitely has responded to food system demands. And across the Farm Bill, in many areas, and even beyond the Farm Bill, you can identify many components that are targeted to 
the broader food system and this food system increasingly being demanded by the consumer. There are marketing programs and business programs. There are rural community development programs. There are even in the nutrition assistance section specific carve-outs or programs that help support a broader local food system. On the right, you can think about the role of a USDA organic seal, for example, as part of that food system discussion. The Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food campaign of about a decade ago was a substantial player at the time uh, in terms of trying to champion uh, new local food systems that are connected between producers and consumers. But fundamentally, there is quite a bit there for the local foods community to take a look at as well. Which leaves us asking questions about where we go from here. And I have championed for many years that agriculture fundamentally is trying to serve multiple challenges or multiple demands from society. There's a role for commercial agriculture, the large scale commodity driven agricultural systems that fundamentally provide the nation's food supply and increasingly the world's food supply. But there are also simultaneously local food systems, agricultural production geared towards that local market or that local uh, connection to serve consumer tastes and preferences. Agriculture also plays a role in bioenergy and agriculture certainly plays a role in managing the nation's environmental resources and increasingly providing what we could call agroecosystem benefits or environmental goods and benefits, goods and services. Let's focus on those two food sectors or food demands there and you get a sense of where we might go. <clears throat> the best way to think about commercial, commodity, large-scale agriculture that serves food supplies as I see it is to think about what it's done over the last now 70 plus years. USDA data from 1950.2, roughly a tripling of farm output on essentially the same level of inputs over the last 70 plus years. We've increased some purchased inputs. We've reduced the usage of some other inputs like land and labor. We've ultimately tripled output on effectively the same aggregate level of input. Output divided by input is productivity. Now that blue line represents productivity and productivity has grown faster than US population. In another uh, way of saying that, we might say supply has continually grown faster than demand. Well, if supply grows faster than demand, prices go down. And that red line represents the fact that real aggregate US agricultural prices have fallen by more than half during that same general period. Now, that falling price is often to the consternation and the continual discussion and debate within, uh, ag, uh, within the ag community and the farm bill discussion, but that falling price is also the fundamental success story of U.S. agriculture and its increased ability to serve global food demand and its increased ability to provide that safe, secure, abundant, affordable food supply. But to effectively do that, large-scale, commodity-driven commercial agriculture fundamentally continues to look for a policy framework that provides for, doesn't guarantee success, but provides a framework for success. And that includes a continued discussion about a safety net, and we will see that discussion continue into the next Farm Bill. But it also includes a broader policy framework that is, maybe as much as anything, predictable and rational. And that includes our trade discussions and developments it also includes the broader regulatory framework here in the U.S., whether it's a focus on environmental issues or food safety or technology or labor or on down the line. Macroeconomy uh, issues and macroeconomic policy the same way. And then there's that last bullet there, research investment. This sounds like a, a bias from a land-grant economist, um, and it clearly is a bias of mine, but I would certainly argue that says if productivity has been the driver of success, then research has been a key component of improving that productivity over time. And so there is a role, or at least I, I feel there would be a role for continued research investment there as well. Now, having said that about global food demand, think about the local food systems. And as I shared earlier, it's about demanding all these different attributes and arguably because of the luxury and the ability to demand those things. If we talked about the food system and the consumer producer connection in the food system, Maybe a better way to think of this is to frame it as to what the producer would like. The producer, given their choice, would probably love to be in the bottom right-hand corner of that diagram. This is a diagram prepared from research and analysis by the Center for Food Integrity 
uh, directed by Charlie Arnott. But their analysis over the years has said, well, if producers want the freedom to operate, that freedom to sort of say, you know, shut up with your mouthful, there's nothing to complain about here, trust us, we, uh, we're operating in the best interest of society, just leave us alone. Producers might love that freedom to operate. You know, there's a joke in there somewhere about there are lots of producers, lots of ranchers that frankly like cattle a whole lot more than they like people. So they just want to be able to operate down there. Consumers will not give producers the freedom to operate that license, if you will, unless they fundamentally have trust in the agricultural system. And that trust builds from confidence and competence and influence. <clears throat> you got to be competent. The ag system has to continually demonstrate its competence and do the right things and adopt best practices and show that it's uh, improving over time. It also has to have confidence. It has to share values. It isn't enough to say, trust us, we have your interests at heart, trust us, we make wise decisions with our resources. It's that we share the same kinds of values that you share as a consumer and that when we understand that we are both driven by the same values, you can appreciate our role in, in helping to serve you and to provide the food supply. That's what agriculture has to fundamentally realize at some point. Influence is in there because it also does fundamentally take a connection to teach consumers or to reach consumers. It's not so much the advocacy or the ag advocacy messages that we often hear that said, if only we had a better ag literacy and consumers better understood what happened on the farm, they'd trust us and they wouldn't bother us. It's not just do they better understand it, it's do you have an ability to demonstrate and connect with consumers that you actually share their values and, you, and that agriculture appreciates the consumer's point of view as opposed to tries to simply teach the consumer. All of those things contribute to whether the producer really has the trust of the consumer and this social license to operate. Now that may not be driven by federal policy, that might be driven by consumer or by consumers and by supply chain demands. And so when we think about the policy framework for local food systems, I put all these things up here at once. That next to last one on there is food system and supply chain requirements. It might be the supply chain, the corporate food supply chain that says we will only source ingredients from this uh, process method or from this, this sector. Uh, those demands may go much further uh, in sort of changing or influencing the food system than whatever federal policy gets discussed. But along the lines of federal policy, I put food security at the top. Because food security, frankly, has to recognize that if this local food system is to work by focusing on the higher value demands and the higher end attributes that a consumer with purchasing power is, is making, it cannot ignore the consumer that also is at the lower end of the economic spectrum and faces affordability uh, questions and budget challenges for food security. So food security and frankly the success of the overall commercial agriculture system really is almost a required foundation before local food systems can succeed. And then local food systems need a regulatory framework that's predictable, just like commercial agriculture. It needs to understand what those rules are and what they mean and, and how they work. Something like the organic standard uh, is a demonstration of a regulatory framework that has transitioned over time. When it was introduced decades ago, it had various meanings and it was certified by lots of different organizations and you could not predict from one to the other what it meant and what it didn't mean. USDA stepped in, federal legislation drove USDA to step in and establish a nationally defined standard definition of what organic production means. Now it's not to say we all agree on it, we still see debates and arguments about what the organic standard allows or doesn't allow, but fundamentally we acknowledge that in we see that there is a standard and it does communicate a message to consumers. So that's part of the question here and what's a regulatory framework for local food systems? How does the system work? Are there standards that need some uh, intervention here to, to better police? As a broad overview in, on farm and food systems, that gives you some perspective of the policy issues that show up in a farm bill and in the broader 
policy discussions. When we talk about farm policy and generally talk more about that large scale commodity commercial agricultural system, we're typically talking about the role of the safety net and increasingly maybe the role of conservation programs in the farm bill because of an increased focus on climate smart agriculture or potential practices that agriculture might be incentivized to adopt. But when we talk about food policy, we also have to distinguish between are we talking about food assistance and the focus on uh, alleviating poverty and, and improving food security, or are we talking about local food systems and the ability to respond to and fulfill consumer preferences and demands. Nutrition policy is in there as well. I didn't speak much to nutrition policy, but that may be a nexus where both of those foodies and neo-foodies still gather together around one common uh, sort of uh, policy question. But those are all farm and food policy questions ahead of us, just as there are many other issues in the farm bill and in the broader uh, ag policy space. I hope that sets up a discussion, gives you some insight into the kinds of issues that are continually on the radar and the kinds of issues that will demand challenging responses here in the years ahead. Thank you again to Brad Lubin for providing us with that great overview and history of the Farm Bill. So uh, again, he set us up well for a discussion here, and so we really wanted to bring this back locally. Why does the Farm Bill matter for us as Nebraskans, and how can we get involved in shaping the next Farm Bill? So with that, I would love to introduce our panel of local experts. First, we have Kayla Bergman, who grew up on a row crop and cow-calf farm in the southeast corner of Iowa. She has a background of conservation and watershed management and currently manages the Ag Policy Portfolio at the Center for Rural Affairs. Kayla is located in central Iowa in a town called Nevada, where she and her husband Ryan own a small farm that they just seeded in the CRP program. <clears throat> Graham Christensen is the founder and president of GC Resolve a communications and consulting company which focuses on grassroots community development, mobilization, and education with an emphasis on environment and equality and the creation of more resilient communities. Christensen owns and operates a second business, GC Revolt, a solar and alternative energy development company, and is the state secretary and a director for the Nebraska Farmers Union. Graham is Still actively involved in operating Christensen Farms, Inc. with his family, where the Christensens are adopting regenerative principles on their farm. And then finally, Eric Saviano is the program manager for Nebraska Appleseed's Economic Justice, Food and Nutrition Access Program. In this role, he works to help individuals and families across the state get the food and nutrition they need to thrive. His work specifically focus on, focuses on advocacy for SNAP and child nutrition programs in schools. So welcome to our esteemed panelists today. We're so excited to have you. Everyone, please feel free to start dropping your questions in the chat. We wanna keep this informal and use this time as well as we can. So I have a few questions to get us started, but we're, we're excited to hear from everyone and have this be an active discussion. Move into gallery view here. Um, so to start us out, could each of the panelists please, uh, anything you wanna add as far as you know, what your organization does and specifically what areas of the Farm Bill you're most paying attention to or involved in advocating around. I'll invite Kayla to start us off. Sure. Well, first off, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to have a good discussion here today. Uh, so as Megan said, my name is Kayla Bergman. I'm actually located in central Iowa in a town called Nevada, um, but I uh, have colleagues in Nebraska and um, that work on my team. So the Center for Rural Affairs, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, um, was founded in 1973 in Hill, Nebraska and moved to Lyons in 2004. Both of those are in the Northeast corner of the state. Um, we have staff scattered across uh, Nebraska and then we have an office here in central Iowa as well as a staff member in Minnesota and one in South Dakota now. Uh, we work to ensure vibrant rural communities and the Farm Bill is a huge part of what makes a rural community vibrant. My team specifically focuses on Title II of the Farm Bill, so the conservation title. Uh, we work to ensure strong working lands conservation programs, which include the Environmental Quality Incentives Program and Conservation Stewardship Program, uh, or CSP. Both of those programs uh, incentivize voluntary conservation practices, um, and they are administered by the Natural Resources Conservation Service. 
as a rural con, uh, organization, we also uh, focus on um, Title VI of the Farm Bill, which is rural development. Uh, that really means a lot to us. We actually champion the Rural Micro Entrepreneur Assistance Program, or RMAP. Uh, this provides micro loans and technical assistance to micro entrepreneurs. Um, and finally, Title XI of the Farm Bill, which is crop insurance, is another part of our work. Uh, we work to educate non traditional producers on their risk management options. This includes both small grains and organic producers. Thanks, Kayla. Eric, how about you go next? Yeah, thanks also for inviting me to present. Um, I work with Nebraska Appleseed. We're a nonprofit law and policy organization that works statewide and then also with federal legislation and even local. Um, so we generally are fighting for justice and opportunity for all Nebraskans. That's a fun way of saying that we're you know, fighting for the, po the folks uh, with low incomes, um, the folks who struggle to um, you know, make ends meet at the end of the month and, and put food on the table in general. So uh, my work with our food and nutrition access team is centered around the SNAP program which is Title IV of the Farm Bill. Um, there are other food assistance programs, but um, according to, I guess, Bill Bill's presentation earlier, we, we fall under the foodies definition. Uh, and I hadn't heard that term before, uh, except like going out to eat and eating fancy stuff. But yeah, I guess we are that uh, traditional foodies definition and, and supporting folks in poverty and finding ways to support the, the, um, the food and nutrition access side of the farm bill. Thanks, Eric and Graham. Could you round us off here? Hey everyone, my name is Graham Christensen from Oakland, Nebraska, and part of the fifth generation family farm. Um, grew up through the whole American ag movement um, with the tractor cades and in the middle of all of that and started seeing, um, you know, what this policy ask was back then. And, and it's still something that is a solid principle, but it's a fair price, not over subsidization, but, but literally just getting a fair price for the, the product that we produce. And if weather or some alternative circumstance wipes us out that there is a safety net so one year doesn't define you know this you know this this tradition of farming um, I would like to be able to get back into some of those things and so we're advocating these um, but you can see after um, Brad's presentation that um, and you can maybe can relate or understand that we're more fo focused on a, a, a little bit more of a reform farm bill there's pieces that are missing some of the messaging is off. Some of the priorities seem just a little bit um, backwards. And so with that, we're more, um, we're more working out of the camp that's dealing with uh, these, these reform issues around increasing biodiversity, um, allowing more animal integration back on the land, um, not increasing in confinement systems, but, but still having livestock as that staple, but integrating them back in the land to mimic those those rotational grazing systems um, through migratory movement of animals that showed us a, a balanced ecosystem for thousands and, and thousands of years. Um, we're interested in, in equity issues. You know, how are we going to be able to streamline the system so it's, it's fair to all approaches and people involved in the in the ag se sector, um, as well as kind of shifting over to the consumer and making sure that that they're having ample access or ability to access highly nutritious foods and and something else that we consider a vital reform piece that needs to be front and center of the discussion right now is that that young farmer succession piece that that young farmer succession piece is is really being left out of the conversation we don't have a plan for that in this country yet um uh that you know and so what we're really worried about right now is that as the, you know, the baby boomer generation who has seen the land concentrate, um, you know, just as we've seen the industry concentrate, um, this land has concentrated into less, um, less and less landholders. And so they're become bigger and bigger. Um, there has been limited access at this point for young people to get back on the land. 
but yet all this land is going to transition over the next 20 years. And so if this only transitions to big investors like we're seeing now, or you see more um, influence from uh, multinational um, mega companies, uh, then we have a big national security threat. And so, you know, we're, we're really um, starting to focus on how we can be able to transition the land to the next generation. And I think the next generation is, is um, leaves us with a much greater opportunity to, to do the things around um, food production and health and nutrition um, that we really need if we're going to have a healthy society. All right. Thank you so much. And I think you led us really well into our next question, which is, why do you all think that it's important for Nebraskans to pay attention and advocate around the farm bill? You know, it's a big federal policy. We're used to maybe talking about local policy or state policy. Why is this such an important time to be thinking about and engaging with the farm bill for anyone? I can go first, again, if you don't mind. Uh, so no matter your role in agriculture, even if it's a consumer, your voice matters in the farm bill development. Uh, so it's important that you pay attention to all that the farm bill does. Um, Brad kind of explained that in his presentation earlier, uh, but you've got conservation, subsidy, SNAP, energy, so many other topics. Uh, so I would encourage you to find uh, an area that you are passionate about and can advocate for. There are many groups like the three of us uh, represented today on this panel that um, have the resources to help you advocate for what's important to you in the Farm Bill, um, including talking to your legislators, writing letters to the editor, or simply just talking amongst your communities about these issues. Uh, we're really fortunate here in the Midwest that uh, many of our congressmen and women represent us on the Agriculture Committee, which as we know, develops the Farm Bill and uh, forming relationships with those individuals uh, throughout the Farm Bill cycle, um, even if it's through an organization uh, like one of ours, uh, is really helpful when it comes closer to the Farm Bill um, to have those existing relationships and uh, comfort with advocacy. Uh, last, I'll say uh, conversations are already happening for the Farm Bill. The House Ag Committee had two hearings this week uh, alone, and so we're kind of ramping up to that phase. Um, our organization is um, in the, the development phase of our platform for the Farm Bill, and we'll quickly transition to our legislator outreach here in the coming months. So now is the time to get on board. Thanks, Kayla. Anyone want to add to her great thoughts there? Yes, um, would love to do that. Um, I would just say that, you know, we're seeing lack of young people um, on the land. Uh, we're seeing extreme water contamination. We're seeing soil loss um, in December with that crazy windstorm with all these, you know, tornadoes and you know that, you know, we've never had a situation like that. But if you notice the day after um, when you went outside and you, you looked at your house or your apartment or your vehicle that you had left outside, it was all coated with dust. And what we're seeing is that because we have re-uncovered the land and ripped out the shelter belt tree systems, that the dust storms are starting to percolate back up. These things that happen with the farm bill impact everything from the environment you live in um, to the nutrition that gives you health. And so, and, and to that point, as we look across the country, we have an obesity epidemic that's leaving more people susceptible to disease or virus like COVID-19. Furthermore, we talked about the land issue. I already mentioned that in the first point that we are bumping into a national security issue. If we don't all get involved in the farm bill and this hundred billion dollar package does impact every single one of us, this is the piece. This is the topic. This is the federal package that little, little things or shifts in those dollars can impact the direction and the priorities that we choose in our nation for a long time. So I think this is a package for everybody. Um, and I think that because of those reasons, it's time that everybody looks at this as the centerpiece piece of federal legislation to get involved with. And I just, I think that this group up here has the ability to help more of you integrate into the conversation. And as Kayla was saying, 
uh, everybody's starting to slice and dice this 2023 farm bill right now. So now is the time to engage. Let's, let's take this seriously. And I'll add just briefly to those great comments that um, I liked the description of coalition building uh, among the farm bill. I think it does bring together the nutrition advocates. It brings together the farm um, farm interests and and uh, conservationists. All the folks on this call have a role to play, and it takes coalitions like ones from Nebraska and ones from other um, farming states and other states to um, make folks make our voices heard. But it starts with one. Um, but the other thing, at least from our perspective, is that the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, uh, the TFAP program, Emergency Food Assistance Program, um, and Commodity Supplemental Food Program, these are things that fall under that Title IV, at least for our um, kind of projects. These are things that are not just uh, relegated to the urban space. They're not just for suburban or, or the rural folks. Uh, food insecurity, food scarcity happens, and it, it rolls with, with, uh, with the government assistance that's come through, but also with the um, changes of the, the dynamics in the environment and, and COVID especially right now. So um, all of these programs, you probably know somebody on them or you've had to use them yourselves. Uh, SNAP, uh, emergency food boxes, commodity foods for elderly, those kind of things are all part of this bill. And uh, your stories or the stories from your community will impact people in the elected offices. We've seen it happen at local, state, and national levels. So sharing stories is one way to really impact this. All right, thank you all. And I think you, you set us up well for this next one as, as well. So you've talked about a lot of the topics and areas we should be paying attention to. Uh, as you're monitoring the early debates happening for the 2023 Farm Bill, are there any like big debates, fights, areas of concern that you think we should be paying attention to coming into this Farm Bill? Maybe I'll, I'll get my uh, SNAP priorities out of the way since we just ended on it. Um, but yes, yeah, SNAP, uh, the we were excited to see the SNAP program hold flat under a hostile um, administration and and um, and opportunities to cut it last farm bill in 2018. Um, this year we're hoping to see some of the priorities expand because the need is so much greater now than it was then too. Um, so access and eligibility for the program, we're hoping to see increase. I think the folks that are left out of the program at the moment are immigrants, um, immigration uh, populations, refugee populations, and some folks who uh, have no dependents. We'd also love to see the, the overall benefit increase. We know that lots of folks can't make it to the end of the month uh, with the existing benefit level. And so uh, it'd be useful to be making sure that program is targeted toward those that most need it, but also making sure that they aren't continuing to struggle without the, the needs being met. Um, I think farm to school is a, is a smaller issue that got some promotion last year, but we've seen a huge push in, in Nebraska and from folks on this call um, to, to build momentum and see it move forward as well. So uh, overall, I think there's room to improve the program uh, and other programs like it to make sure folks are better served by the federal dollars going into it. I can go next. Um, things that I think that are in play um, for uh, little reform um, pieces that would be um, good and helpful to get engaged with. If the farmer is going to diversify out of monoculture, but they're in a situation where they're uh, cash strapped. They don't have a lot of extra cash, but even though they, they may have a lot of money tied up in assets, it just makes it hard to reinvest in new infrastructure to be able to get more diverse products like small grains, legumes, or agroforestry products to the marketplace. 
So through some conversations we're having um, with congressional offices, we're seeing that there is interest in trying to find an avenue where additional funding can be locked that helps the Stephen Tuckers of Southwest Nebraska get his mung beans to Denver instead of having to go, you know, around out to the West Coast somewhere to process and then come back and it's not a for it doesn't make sense it's too expensive now. Um, or for this, you know, group of farmers around our area in Northeast Nebraska that are looking to raise hazelnuts, you know, so seeing unlocking some investment into new new processing infrastructure or new equipment infrastructure that helps these these farmers be able to actually shift into meeting the increasing market demand um, that Brad kept talking about in the video. That's one thing that we're seeing an opportunity for. And one avenue we're exploring is just opening up BAPG, the value added producer grant a little bit more to enable that. Um, but but that's, where, that's where conversations have gone lately. We'll see where this goes out. But I think that on-farm infrastructure for diverse products is a big deal. Um, another one that's real hot right now that we see uniformity across the boards would be looking at the conservation title and figuring out how to bring up the NRCS technicians so that they have expanded education that they can be able to help farmers as we aggressively transition to more biodiverse systems that are producing a lot more food fit for human con you know, um, consumption, but also drawing down carbon, stabilizing the soil and those roots you know, filtering out our water system so they're clean again. Um, but that, that educational piece shouldn't just be solely focused on the NRCS um, technicians, although that's obviously a, a foundational piece and very important. It should enable other representatives in communities to be able to garner these skills and share them in culturally appropriate ways in their own respective communities so that those skills are not um, walled off from many communities. Because when I talk around the state and beyond, I see that there is heart and passion for growing food in the black community or in the Native American community, as well as in you know, my little rural community. So the technical assistance and, and funding for that should also be shifting into a lot of different communities. And also of course, into our community colleges, HBCUs, um, Indian colleges and universities so that we can start actually creating that pipeline to allow more young people that, that access um, back onto the land, the pathway onto the land so their ingenuity, creativity, energy, entrepreneurship skills can play in a future where we have more enterprise able to produce more things on, on the land. Um, this land accessibility piece is gaining traction. So I think looking at how we invest in that young generation, what is the way? Well, we're trying to figure out if there can be a government holding area for for um, landowners that want to ship their land um, into that that portal or that um, trust, that land trust, and then as long as some criteria would be met, such as business management training, um, soil health based, you know, training reg around regenerative ag practices, you know, appropriate in certain ecosystems, um, and of course a tenure, having being on the land for a certain time, showing that continual commitment, that land actually transitions. So there is some movement and some discussion and a broader conversation going on around this, this, this um, prioritizing this next generation of landowners and, and farmers. And then the other two things I'd say there's movement on BIPOC internships into the USDA, um, FSA directors act douche now, as well as uh, Congressman um, Fortenberry's office have both um, uh, are both looking at prioritizing more avenues that allow a more diverse set of, of um, representatives to be in the agriculture, the USDA in the future, I think which will help make easier and balance out some of these things for the next generation. And finally, those, those farm service agency beginning loan, farmer loans, you know, you're capping it at $600,000 on the land, which if it's a conventional system, that doesn't get you anywhere, you know? So there's gotta be a fix on that $600,000 level. And then also asking a new farmer, what if it's an immigrant community coming into the United States, trying to lay down permanent roots on the land, but they have to do three to five years of a Schedule F. Schedule F is only for, that's, your, that's how you report your farm income. Um, 
if you have a number of farms and you're a beginning farmer, how are you going to report three to five years on the Schedule F? That means all these folks don't get a chance to actually have a beginning farmer loan. So these are easy things that can be tweaked. Um, they are reform pieces, though, and we think all of those things are in play based on our conversations right now. Um, I'll quickly add a, a couple of pieces here. Um, I think uh, a pivotal debate that's going to be happening or is already happening is the role of the federal government in uh, these carbon markets or carbon payment programs um, that are on the rise. So as exciting of an economic opportunity this is for farms and rural communities, uh, currently these programs are all following their own protocols and procedures. Um, which includes verification um, on carbon sequestration. So it's important that the federal government, specifically USDA, uh, get involved in ensuring uh, these programs are doing the right thing and that they are protecting the farmer that is implementing these conservation practices. Two other things I'll mention, um, Graham touched on this a little bit, but uh, these working lands conservation programs at USDA, uh, I talked about the conservation stewardship program and EQIP earlier. Um, they are oversubscribed and underfunded. Uh, in 2020 alone, only 47% of qualified applicants for the conservation stewardship program were accepted into the program. Um, this is mostly because of not enough funding. Um, and since its inception in 2008, um, the 2008 Farm Bills, what created CSP, uh, the program's funding has been cut in half. So we really need to restore funding um, because there are more producers excited about doing great conservation. Um, so that's important. And then third thing I'll say is supporting our underserved producers, which includes BIPOC farmers. Um, these groups have been uh, long marginalized and there are many organizations, including ours, that are advocating for changes that will make these programs more accessible um, for those underserved groups. Super important and definitely a part of the conversation right now. Thank you all. So we've got some great questions in the chat. Uh, Ben's question is really, so you guys have raised so many important topics and issues. If, if someone is fired up right now and they want to start to get involved in advocacy, uh, if, and they've never done it before, how can they engage in the farm bill? How can they get involved? I know Eric mentioned the power of stories, but, you know, and this is a great time for all of you to drop in your links if you have <laughs> newsletters and things like that, but just how, how do people get started? I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but find an advocacy organization that, that is working and talking about that whatever you're passionate about. So for SNAP, um, Eric is uh, a great resource there for working lands conservation and this carbon space. Um, our organization is great for that. So get in, in touch with them. They We have the resources to kind of help you, um, again, tell your story. Authenticity is the real, real root of um, effective policy change. So if you have a story because you are enrolled in one of these programs or affected by policy related to the farm bill, um, find an outlet for that voice. So I would really encourage you to get involved in an advocacy organization like one of our three here represented um, and stay in touch. I would, I would say that um, there are some um, organizations or groups to kind of follow to, first of all, you know, get your your foundation, your educational foundation um, on solid solid land um, in there. And of course, Appleseed and Center for Rural Affairs are two of them. I would say that uh, for a good kind of reform-minded group, very focused on the soil health component, uh, I like following LandCore. Um, LandCore also uh, always in their newsletter, um, I think they do one a week, they put out good reads, articles, books, and stuff that offer more context um, around the farm program and, and other things around soil health. So they're fun um, to watch. I'm excited about Kiss the Ground's new Regenerating America program, which is focused on some of these reform pillars. Um, you'll be hearing, it's, it's just kind of been a soft launch, but you're going to hear more about that over the next, over the time leading up. As you get closer to the um, federal farm bill, you'll start seeing some updates coming from the National Farmers Union. I'd like to see them get into some of these um, more reform-minded pieces, but they have a good policy structure and basis um, that is, is good to follow. Um, I mentioned the American Ag Movement. I think by looking at their policy asks from those late 70s and early 80s from that time period, that we can learn a lot and we can get strong foundational principles. And I think that 
what they were asking for should be studied um, and should be noted. And we can build off of some of those things as we fix you know, this, um, this, this issue we're dealing with. Uh, we at GC Resolve have a um, email list that uh, definitely um, that definitely talks about these kind of issues. And so if you wanted to get on that, you can just email me or if you had other specific ways um, regarding specific engagement to congressional de our congressional delegation, um, we love to talk about those things. And so I'm just Graham at gcresolve.com and I'll put that in the chat box here um, in, a, in a little bit. And just once again, the, the best way, the most effective way is to start weighing in um, into a constructive manner with our congressional delegation. We have power players um, right now in powerful positions. And, you know, so Congressman Bacon in Omaha, um, we've had a little bit of trouble tracking him down, um, but he is on the agricultural committee and so has a, a huge chance to be able to do some things um, and, and push some levers that will allow some of these pieces to go. Um, we've continued to see very open interest and engagement out of uh, Congressman Fortenberry's office on these uh, regenerative ag and soil health um, base uh, pieces. Um, we have, um, have been engaged with uh, uh, U.S. Senator Deb Fisher, who's on the Agricultural Committee. She has interest in to, uh, soil health policy. And if you can make a good business perspective out of this, um, Senator Sass is also very interested in these things, too. So now, as far as um, Adrian Smith goes, I know he does represent the largest block of land being used for agriculture in the nation, but I'm not sure that, you know, I'm not really sure what's going on inside of, of that office on these issues. Um, definitely um, doesn't have quite the high ranking committee positions with exception of SAS that the other ones do, but we have a chance to open up communication on these issues. So, so use these groups, get involved, talk with us and, and, and engage. Thanks everyone. And I just want to acknowledge we are at time. So there's one more really great prep question from Robinette Farms. So if our panelists would be kind enough to stick around for a few more minutes, we'll answer that question. If you do need to go, I'm dropping in the chat the evaluation for today's session. So uh, we hope you'll stick around for the whole day and, and attend tomorrow if you can. But if not, we would still love your feedback on today's session so we can keep improving. So I encourage you to do that. And again, we're going into a lunch break next, so there'll be a little bit of a break before the afternoon session. So uh, as, as a wrap-up piece, uh, Robinette Farms asked, Brad Lubin's characterization of farm bill foodies and neo-foodies points out at the reality that increasing nutritional content of our food and decreasing the negative environmental impacts will almost certainly raise the cost of food. This puts food access and food quality impact in, con in conflict. Where does this panel see overlap and opportunities for collaboration between the foodies and the neo-foodie interests? I've been rolling that one around in my head since it came in and, and see overlap for sure in that um, increased benefit amounts means that uh, consumers who are restricted by the amount of funds they have, the benefit levels they have, will be able to participate in some of those higher um, what was the, the term, the um, higher class, not class, what is it, uh, less low income people, uh, purchasing styles, so, <laughs> and I'm using big words here. So um, I would hope that there's some overlap, although um, those interests are, are somewhat opposed in different ways. Uh, I also have seen it with at least the, the food economies of school nutrition programs, places like farm to school, those organic farms are selling to districts around the state and making it more available uh, and more present, the fresh fruits and vegetables, the, um, the organic meats and, um, and specifically yeah, products from, from animals. So, the, the, as that increases, more participation, the economy, uh, the demand grows. Hopefully the, the um, and I'm talking a little out of, my, uh, out of my expertise here, but the supply hopefully will grow and be able to uh, decrease costs as well. Those are a few thoughts, but uh, open to anybody else as well. Um, I would just say that 
I have, I struggle a little bit with kind of characterizations of foodie um, and neo foodie and kind of that, you know, categorization as some of the neo foodie stuff as elite asks. Um, I think these are kind of health based, more informed health based asks, um, you know, in many cases and, and um, have at one point and should probably have a more dominant focus within the, the food, um, the farm bill program and, and our nation's um, policy around how we produce food and, and how we achieve higher nutrition and, and greater health. Um, so that I think is my first issue, but um, what I, my farmer perspective um, and, and watching through my 42 years of life, what I see going on is that this rapid decline of the farmer has left very few advocates out um, to be able to get this switched around and that these kind of this kind of bridge building amongst these um, these kind of growing interests um, is really important because those growing interests that um, lie a lot of times within the consumer base of the of the of this country um, are where the numbers are to affect policy change and that the farmer will make these things happen and they will become a solution to the issues that we're dealing with but they're not going to be able to do this as quickly um, as we need them to unless the, we have an intellectual consumer base that is demanding what goes into their body um, is good for them and their, and their family as well and, until we increase transparency so that there is a relationship even if the farmers in Nebraska and the consumers in New York that you can scan the product and see that Christensen stored this much carbon and had this much diversity that's been added and uses these kind of practices. Those relationships need to be established, but this is why the farm bill is for this other portion of folks, primarily the consumer. Um, the consumer has to now drive these efforts. And so those categorizations, whatever they are, um, are part of that. They're a growing part of that as more understanding and awareness has happened and we've felt we've been impacted by more big disruptions. Um, so, so let's think of it that way. Let's enable our friends of the consumer, speaking from my farmer self again, to, um, to take the torch on this and let's better work together on all these things so that we can have a farm bill that truly, truly, um, you know, does all the things that, that we've been talking about um, in the prior part of this presentation. All right, Kayla, we'll give you the final word if you'd like to add anything. Nope, I don't think I have anything to add to this question. Okay. Well, thank you everyone so much for participating in today's uh, discussion. I want to thank the speakers again, um, Brad Lubin from UNL and our three esteemed panelists here. Uh, we hope this has inspired you and challenged you to think about how you can get involved with the Farm Bill and, and other forms of advocacy around food and farm issues. So 